right, welcome back. What you're looking at as live pictures from the Supreme Court, where any minute now, we hope, there will be some lawyers arriving there with uh, their responses from their clients who are the respondents in this case, namely the IBC, its chair, Wafula Chabukati, and of course, uh, what we expect tonight is the uh, lawyers for uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, president, uh, elect president, uh, whose election is being challenged. You can see there, it looks like uh, everyone is very secure there, the policemen uh, keeping watch there. But anyway, as soon as that happens, we're going to take you to the Supreme Court to see what exactly will be going on there. But I have uh, the two gentlemen here, Mudhomi Yankolu and Waikwa Wanyoike. I've been speaking to them. And right now I'm joined on phone by Martin Olo, and Martin, uh, you have been listening to our conversation here, and what we've been discussing is uh, some of the foreign judgments that we've relied on, at least in part, in making our own decisions here. And in 2013, the, the, the Supreme Court relied in part with, uh, on some authorities, as they are called in law, but mainly uh, arguments, decisions made in Uganda and Nigeria. And, and, and the two gentlemen here didn't have very kind words to say uh, about that. I don't know what your view is about how relevant some of these are to our local context here in Kenya. I think that um, let's be fair to the previous uh, uh, ruling or to the previous uh, uh, decision that was made by the Supreme Court. And it was made under very difficult circumstances. The first time the Supreme Court had been constituted, and uh, it was also the first time that they were trying, they were actually reaching out. They had a very limited time, about seven days, and we have now extended that to beyond seven days. Now, in the circumstances, any of the mistakes or any of the issues that may have come about can be understandable. That said, there is absolutely nothing wrong with any importation or any reference to judicial decisions made elsewhere within the Commonwealth, and particularly in respect to the issues of presidential elections. So I would say that as much as we may have issues about the quality of those decisions, the reference to those decisions in itself was not a bad thing. But, no, but, Ma but Martin, Martin, the argument that they seem to be making, and they'll make it for themselves in a short while, is that yes. some of those countries have political systems that are not exactly inspiring, that if you're talking about Uganda, for example, that the implicit message there is that, well, we would be happy to be like Uganda when we go drawing from the decisions that have been made there regarding presidential elections that in themselves are very controversial in those countries. No, any of those gentlemen on your, on, on, on your panel should understand that when you look at Montesquieu, and Montesquieu is telling you about separation of powers, surely you cannot condemn a judiciary on the basis of the executive. I mean, certainly there are differences here, politics 101, law 101. So in that respect alone, you cannot say that you cannot refer to Uganda because, uh, I mean, who said that Uganda is different because they present themselves as three arms of government, the judiciary, the legislature, and the executive. Now, you can say that in your view, the Ugandan, uh, the executive is more uh, powerful, but that's a view. But certainly they present a Montesquian view of what separation of powers is about, and in that respect, let us now try and adjudge the judiciary for what it is, whether it's in Uganda, whether it's in Nigeria, whether it's in Ghana. What we are looking at is that there is the independence of the judiciary. And because of that independence, we would like to judge them on the basis of their utterances, on the basis of their oracles and their submissions. So that alone should not be an issue. That said, I want to say, suggest that there is nothing wrong with case law. And case law is usually imported from other jurisdictions. Okay, and Martin, I'm, I'm just going to bring Muzomi into this conversation to just uh, sort of respond to what you've been saying, because he's been hearing you, Muzomi. Martin says, what is wrong? <laughs> uh, there are several things wrong. Like I told you, Joe, our law itself, and I'm referring uh, in particular to the Judicature Act, uh, which is Chapter 8 of the Laws of Kenya, as a rule that could be useful in this debate. And it says, uh, whereas our courts may borrow from the common law, because all these are common law decisions, those decisions uh, shall, and, and the common law itself shall only be applied insofar as the circumstances of Kenya are appropriate and subject to such qualifications as those circumstances read necessary. 
I'll refer you to a case actually decided in the colonial times itself, a case called Nyali versus the Attorney General. Uh, it was a case that came from the Kenya colony, but was decided in London in the Privy Council of the House of Lords, which then was the highest uh, judicial uh, court in England. And what Lord Denning, as lawyers will call him, uh, uh, simply said is uh, that particular clause I referred to you uh, is designed to warn East African judges and judges in the colonies, we were a colony then, uh, from this uh, uncritical copying and pasting and imitation of the common law and foreign judgments. And if I may tell you in his exact words, he says, just like with the English hook, uh, the oak tree, so it is with the common law, while it has many manifest principles of logic and uh, a sense of justice, you cannot transplant it in foreign lands and expect it to drive with the same vigor and vitality to drive in England because it has certain offshoots uh, that are uniquely English in origin that must be pruned off. So we are not saying that judges cannot uh, borrow from foreign case law. Uh, our message, I'd, and I don't think uh, my learned friend has understood it, is what Waiku and I are calling unthinking or uncritical copying of foreign decisions without reflecting on, first of all, is this a country whose democratic model we would want to uh, aspire to as a country? Uh, is the political experience is the prevailing political, social, and economic reality in this country comparable to the one in Kenya? Oh, okay, let, let me just bring in Martin before, before I, you, you jump in. Ma Ma Martin, the point here that uh, Mudom is making has to do with uh, the politics of that country. Should that be important when judges are deciding where they will draw bits of what they're doing from? And I'm saying absolutely not. And I, with due respect to what uh, my friend Mudom is saying, uh, there, is, there is a standard of judgment that we need to apply. When you say uncritical, what do you really mean? And when you say that uh, the, just, I mean, the, the, the kind of democracy and the kind of leadership that's in Uganda is different from here, what do you really mean? At the end of the day, the question is, is the judiciary able to stand up to the executive? Have we seen the standard that we really require? My submission is that we may have had with the, uh, the, the reference and the Supreme Court decision in 2013. But it cannot take away the fact that borrowing and indeed reading from other case law is something that actually influences. And to that extent, it actually it influences or it actually informs the decision that we are, we are just about to take in our circumstances. So I want to submit that what we really require is, again, the relevance and more so whether or not the circumstances that we are referring to are similar. As to whether Uganda is different from Kenya, that's a, another, another discussion. It's a governance issue, it's a political issue. What the judiciary should ever do in terms of the independence of the judiciary and also the independence of the other two arms of government is to ensure that when they're making their decisions, they can actually stand by the decision. And oh, okay, in my oh, respect... Okay, okay my Mart case, Mart Martin, you just hold that, that, that thought in a moment. I want us to just look at some of the cases that have uh, been decided ac across the world that perhaps will give better context to what we are talking about. And, and my colleague Asham Willow prepared a report I want us to have a look at first. As straightforward as election petitions may appear to many, the history of presidential petitions around the world is testament to just how complex a process it is. In one hour, Al Gore and George W. Bush will face off against each other for the first time. Perhaps one of the most quoted presidential battles is the 2000 contest of the then Texas governor George W. Bush and the then U.S. Vice President Al Gore. The race had been tight from the very beginning, and on the eve of the election, the tally was neck and neck. Although Al Gore was the favorite to win, at dawn, the entire race was hinged on the state of Florida, where Bush was leading with 1,800 votes. But concerns were mounting. Voters in Florida had complained of problems with the electronic voting machines. A large number of ballots had not been properly punched and did not reveal who the voter intended to vote for. 
a local court ordered for the recount of 10,000 ballots in the city of Palm Beach. But Al Gore petitioned to have ballots in four contentious counties be recounted in a formal case. Although a manual recount was indeed ordered, the case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. Bush argued that Florida law had violated the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, explaining that the recount undermined the sanctity of the American presidential election system. In the end, the Supreme Court ruled in Bush's favor. But one judge's dissenting opinion left a cloud of uncertainty hanging over that case to date. Closer home, Côte d'Ivoire, Ghana, Nigeria, and Uganda are often cited when comparing with Kenya's judicial progress. In Côte d'Ivoire, as Laurent Gbagbo and Alassane Ouattara faced off in the December 2010 presidential election, all indications were that Ouattara had flawed the incumbent. Bagbo appealed to the Constitutional Council to rule on allegations of massive irregularities in the North. Even though international observers acknowledged Watara's win, Bagbo claimed that electoral officials were intimidated by rebels in the North, leading to ballot staffing. The court's verdict found Bagbo's requests admissible, but partially founded. Results from seven areas were cancelled, and Bagbo was proclaimed as the re-elected president. In its judgment of the 2013 petition, the Supreme Court of Kenya quoted some of these examples from around the world. On the issue of rejected votes, the bench mentioned the Bush versus Al Gore case. On the issue of the materiality of errors in a presidential election, the bench quoted the 2012 Ghanaian petition between Akufo Addo and the Electoral Commission, as well as the persuasions of England's Lord Denning in the Morgan versus Simpson case. Wow, interesting look at some of those cases from around the world. And Waikwa, you were about to say something. Martin there saying, well, the politics isn't such a big deal, the political system. Um, do you agree? No, I don't. Um, I don't agree with uh, Martin, unfortunately. Um, and just uh, to give one illustration, he said uh, that uh, in Uganda, for example, um, the, the, uh, he said that uh, the executive, there is a view that the executive uh, is, an of, is overbearing and so the judiciary may not uh, be able to do the right thing. But then he said that's just a view. It's, it's not a view, it's a fact. Um, we know how long Museveni has been in power. We know what Museveni has been able to do. We've seen what has happened to Besige when he's run for uh, election, um, how he's been restrained uh, from campaigning, sometimes how he's been restrained from presenting cases in court. Uh, and the judiciary is unable to do much. How can you call that uh, a view? That's a fact that uh, the executive is overbearing. If you're going to go to Uganda and borrow their jurisprudence without appreciating that you are going to an environment that is politically intimidating of the judiciary and that that might have colored the decision or the reasoning that the judges arrived at when they made their decision. Uh, the fact that the president is quite controlling and that he, uh, he has quite a big say in terms of who becomes a judge and who gets promoted. Oh, oh. It becomes a problem. Oh, okay, okay, Martin, if you are still with me, Waikwa makes a point that, well, if those judges are not necessarily as independent as perhaps they could be, how can we depend on their rulings? And, and by the way, this is uh, the last comment you're making because our show is coming to an end, so please make it brief. <laughs> Perfect, uh, Joe. You know, what my friend forget is this, that even in the U.S. of A, uh, the government in power appoints the judges. So when the conservatives, the Republicans are in power, they appoint conservative judges. And in that respect, the judges then uh, make decisions according to what they believe in. So uh, it doesn't matter. Uganda is not different from uh, the U.S. and so is Kenya. So at the end of the day, we expect the judges make independent decisions, but they also are influenced by the, uh, the, the ideology of their time. So if you have a Supreme Court that is filled up with conservatives, you expect certain decisions to happen. Now, that said, 
What I want to come back to is that there's absolutely nothing wrong with the, the judicial decisions of Uganda. And you can't say because the Ugandan system is different from Kenya and how different is it, what Waiko is saying remains an opinion. He, say, he cannot say it's a fact. Because we know that if you're looking at the separation of powers, the judiciary, the executive, and the legislature are independent. Now, if you take that logical conclusion, then what you're saying is this. There might be mistakes, but certainly those mistakes are not going to be used as the basis for judgment. So my view is we want to look at, and we have something ahead of us. We do have a petition before us. We are hoping and we are praying that the judiciary, this time around the Supreme Court all, all, all right, all right, Martin. I, I will I will have to cut you short because our our time is is, is up. But I will give uh, Mudomi. You're going to have the last word on this because uh, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, just thirty seconds. Okay, uh, just for the record, Joe, we are not just uh, castigating foreign jurisprudence merely because it is foreign. We are asking ourselves a, a, a factual question: How have the courts in Uganda? Uh, dealt with the electoral injustices in that country so that Ugandan court decisions would be a good reference point. By way of example, the military there no, intimidates no, no, you, people. You, 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 you need to end this there. Your, your point is made. I'm, I'm sorry. We have to end this show right now because in the next few minutes we'll be having our news update from Linda Ogutu who is already on, on standby in a different studio. But thank you very much for watching the Supreme Petition. Remember that we are here every night focusing on this great, uh, what people have called monumental case that is before us in the next couple of days. And we'll wait and see what happens there. But for now, we leave it there. My name is Joe Agay. A very big thank you to my guest, Sophia Wanunna. We'll be giving more updates there in our news update. Good night and God bless you. Friend of the court, an amicus curiae brief is a legal opinion or testimony presented by someone interested in influencing the outcome of a case but who is not party to the case.